there's a lot of conflicting information out there about how your tenure with the Sex Pistols ended. Could you clarify for me exactly what happened? I left. I left. It, it, it became a different thing. Yeah, you know, when I was in the band, I saw it. It was like the kids of the early who, you know, a band by the kids, for the kids. And then it, as soon as we got a bit of traction, Malcolm kind of wanted to keep everything in a state of flux. He was stirring it up between me and John. And it, it was becoming this kind, kind of cartoon strip thing. I was quoted as saying it was like being in the monkeys when I left, not because I wanted to be in the monkeys, but it was, he was pitching it as a put together band and that just wasn't true. We formed ourselves in Malcolm's shop, but he didn't form us. And I firmly believe that we, he was very good at helping us at getting things going and nobody would have heard of us if it wasn't for him. But nobody would have heard of him if it wasn't for us. And so it was quite a symbiotic relationship there. It just became too much and I didn't think Steve and Paul had my back even though I'd written a lot of, not all the songs, but I come up with a lot of the riffs and the tunes and things. And it was their loss. Either back me up or that's how I walked and I walked and that was it. But I thought I had the last laugh because in 1996 when we reformed they could have asked anybody in the world to play bass and they asked me. So yeah. I think they saw the error of their ways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what was the inspiration behind the reunion? Well, I think everything, even still. You know, everything we've all tried to do individually was always measured against the Sex Pistols. People were always clamouring for the Sex Pistols to get back together again. And it kind of overshadows what we've tr all tried to do individually all these years. And um, we thought we might as well give it to them. Plus, earn some money out of it. You know, none of, nobody really made much money out of the band. Hmm. And we did quite well. Yeah. But that was 20 odd years ago. Yeah. Was it a difficult decision for you to leave the Sex Pistols in 77? Not really, no. Mm hmm Okay. Might not. It might not have been the cleverest move, but there was a whole bunch of stuff going on, you know, and I've been approached by EMI before we got dumped saying that, you know, there's, we know there's a problem and we hope you sort it out, but if you don't sort it out, we'd be more than interested in anything that you come up with. Well, I thought, well, that's interesting. And I thought, well, if they think that, other record companies will. And me and John were like that all the time. And, um, it just seemed to be more trouble than it's worth. That's quite a good expression, you know. Yeah. So I, I walked. But then it was turned around that I'd been sacked, but it's not true. I walked. And I've read that prior to your departure, you had already started writing some music for a potential second record. Is this true? Well, I'm always writing songs. and I, I had a band after that called The Rich Kids, and the first single we put out was called Rich Kids by Rich Kids. Now... Whether it would end up being called Rich Kids, but John could have quite easily written some words for that, and that could have been a, a Sex Pistols song with the other guys playing on it. This is a hypothetical question, but if the Pistols were forming today with how different the business is, would you guys have approached things differently? Well, that's a good question, but I really don't know how that would manifest itself at all. Mm hmm. See, I, I, there was a physicality to what we did. We all met because Malcolm McLaren had the coolest shop in, in in the Western world. And because I got a job working there, and then Stephen Paul used to come to try and knit clothes, but had a band going, and I met them. And then Steve was, fancies himself as a singer, but he was like a cross between Tom Jones and Steve Ellis from Steve Ellis's Love Affair wasn't quite the thing and then he learned to play the guitar good and then John came along and he was like the icing on the cake but we all had to physically meet and if he was online somehow I don't I don't know that would happen but then people obviously do because they still film ba form bands and go and do things I do, it would, it's just different you know it's like comparing apples with oranges yeah no I hear you but they're both round <laughs> So I saw an interesting interview you did a couple of years back where you mentioned that as the Sex Pistols, you guys weren't trying to be a political band. You were just speaking your minds, so to speak. So in your view, is it incorrect to label the Sex Pistols as a political band? 
Well, I don't think we ever went out and said vote for so-and-so and vote for so-and-so. A political bad? No, I don't think we were. We were just quite antisocial, really. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, something I've always been curious about is uh, John is Irish and, uh, you know, in the 70s... Yeah. He's half Irish. Half Irish. Okay, he's half Irish. In the 70s, that's, you know, the Troubles were very much an issue. Did that influence your music at all, the Troubles, in any way? Yeah, I think it did. Hey, I think it influenced because John had a chip on his shoulder. You know, he's, I mean, he's not half Irish. I think both his mum and dad are Irish, but he was second generation Irish, you know, brought up in, in, in London, in England. So that must affect you somehow. He had a chip on his shoulder. And yes... The IRA was bombing. There was a real air of despondency in in London. There's power cuts. There was, everybody was on strike. There was rubbish piled high in the streets when we come through. It was a real air of despondency. God Save the Queen was originally called No Future, and it seemed to me, and to John, I would presume, that there was no future unless we did something about it for ourselves. You know, and then when the record came out, it, somebody at the record company realised that it was the Queen's Silver Jubilee, and the song, the first line of the song was God Save the Queen. None of the words were changed, but it, it, they just changed the title of the song. Yeah. But it was originally called No Future, and that's what it seemed like. Yeah, and I've, I've heard that uh, this is, I guess, somewhat of a conspiracy, but I've heard that that song of yours was supposed to be number one in the UK charts, but that was the same week as the Jubilee, so the charts didn't allow it to happen. Is this true? Funny, that. I'd left a band by then, but yeah, that's what happened. But I could have been a number one songwriter. <laughs> <laughs> if, if the Pistols had stayed around and you guys didn't end up breaking up, would you have evolved out of punk eventually, like into you know more poppy music? No, I think we were doomed to. Um, I think we were doomed to kind of split up when we were really. Maybe there might have been another record, but I can't see. <laughs> us down the line doing some sort of parody thing, you know, like the Stones did Angie and John singing that. Hey, Angie! Oh, Angie! <laughs> <laughs> you guys should have done a cover version of that. That would have been hilarious. <laughs> well, when we reformed, I, I did... There was two uh, pretty good ideas floating around. We had to do a live album. And Steve Jones lives in LA. And where are we going to do with the live album? And he said, how about doing it at Caesar's Palace? You know, because he likes Tom Jones and all that kind of stuff. And I thought it was fantastic. Sex Pistols were live from Caesar's Palace. And we approached them and they wrote back and said, no, we do not want you and please do not ask your friends to contact us. No <laughs> way, just, really? It's like a telegram from the mob kind of thing. But I thought if we were going to make a new album, we should do the last thing that anybody would think of doing. And that was a rock opera. And we could have called it Sydney, you know. That would have been quite good. That would have been amazing. I know you guys ended in 2008, the last time you guys were together. Any chance you guys might get back together at some point? I don't know. It's, it's always been last minute, last time we've done it. I don't know. I don't, know. I don't really care. I don't get up in the morning thinking about it. No worries. But I would, I would consider it if it did happen. But um, I think with a couple of us, they'd have a, a pretty good reinforcement underneath the stage. And I'm not talking about me and Paul. So I read an interesting article a little while back. Um, apparently in the 90s, uh, Joe Strummer was thinking about getting the Clash back together. But then mm -hmm. the Pistols, you guys came back first. So he decided not to bring back the Clash because he didn't want it to look like he was coming back on your coattails. Do you know if that's true at all? I don't know if that's true, but I'm friends with Mick Jones. I haven't seen him for a while. But when we'd done the shows, he was saying, what's it like getting back up there? I said, quite a job, really, you know, for this reason, that and the other. And I knew he'd sort of gone and hung out with Joe a little bit, but Joe was sadly wrenched from the surf a bit before his time, so that put an end to that one. Yeah. Um, yeah what, what was um, the relationship between the Pistols and the Clash? I, I was good on the anarchy, sir. I, me and McJones room to get together. You know, everybody had to share a room, and I shared it with me. So, yeah, we were sort of mates. Um, I've always tried to support my friends in their own covers. Um, yeah, and then when I got the rich kids together, they let me use their rehearsal place for nothing, which was Andy. 
It was about a back scratching exercise. Back then, also, I remember doing a photo session with Bob Gruen in Denmark Street, which is like the Tim Pan Alley of England. Yeah, I've been there, yeah. And we, we was outside on the street, and one of the stranglers walked past and said hi. And I said hello back, and John said to me, you don't talk to them, do you? <laughs> Something I've always been very curious about is, you know, in 76, 75, right around that time when the punk scene was really starting to develop, punk wasn't really a thing prior to that. So what did you guys think of yourselves as? We always thought we were the Sex Pistols and the bands that came after us were punk. Do you feel yeah. that punk is an appropriate label for the Pistols? If you look it up in the dictionary, what it means, no, because it's it's not the most pleasant term in the world. Mm. It's a, the prison of punk is somebody who receives and and doesn't give out, if you see what I mean. How did you feel about the commercialization of punk, in a sense? Um, I don't know. I mean, we deliberately signed to AMI Records because we wanted as much... If you write a song, you want as many people to hear it as possible. And when you record it, you want to record it as best as you possibly can. And when it finally comes out, you want it to be promoted as best as you possibly can. So... If everybody hears it and likes it, that's great. And if everybody hears it and don't like it, that's fair enough. But if nobody's heard about it, it's a real piss off. So you want a whole team behind you. So I don't think the commercial thing is wrong. I actually agree with you. Yeah. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe for more because there is a lot more to come. All the videos on my channel are original. I'm the one filming, editing, and conducting all the interviews. So if you guys like what you see and you want to support, the best way to do so is honestly just to subscribe. Thanks for watching.